Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. I have a few stories, all of which are less than 48 hours old. If I go too fast for you, all the links will be down in the comment section below. Okay, first, SBI Holdings. As you know, they are one of the most important partners for Ripple in Asia, and they announced that they are taking a 12% stake in a company called Clear Markets. Clear Markets is an electronics trading company, and this will allow SBI to develop a trading platform for derivatives. It's going to be absolutely for the, uh, the, the institutional investor. Okay, so the uh, Mark Brickwell, the chief executive of Clear Markets, said that 50% of the cash trading is taking place in Japan, and he is very excited about this development. You know, for Mr. Kitao of SBI, this is about the 20th deal he's done this year in the cryptocurrency space. But I think he's moving rather quickly. Here is the Clear Markets website. It's kind of uh, interesting because they have the site in English and Japanese. They are regulatory compliant for the UK, United States, and Japan. Uh, it's, it is not a surprise that SBI chose them because they have a no capital investment, basically zero infrastructure and installation fees. So they'll get you up off the ground in a deal that is really easy. Um, the, the actual financial agreement details were not disclosed for this particular announcement. However, um, there's probably going to be a really good partnership between Clear Markets and SBI, and let me explain why. The founder of Clear Markets is Sean Dorsch. He is an early pioneer in electronics trading systems uh, guy for swaps and OTC derivatives. Originally, he was with JP Morgan in Tokyo back in 1987 to 1993. Uh, he is a Yale graduate in the Japanese language, so I am absolutely sure he can deal with the FSA, which is the watchdog for those financial entities. Uh, let's see, North Carolina, I think, is where the clear markets are, but they do have an office in London and in New York. It's a rather small company. It's, um, according to LinkedIn, just has 24 employees. Now, speaking of the FSA, this just came out today. The FSA, which regulates and licenses all the financial institutions, for example, if you're a, an exchange for cryptocurrency, you have to be licensed by them. And if you have a business that is trading securities, you have to be licensed by them. And this is a little bit of a hurdle for SBI and Monex and, and a few others, because I think they those companies were hoping that they could move their customers freely from one platform to another. However, today the FSA says that they're going to need a third license in order for those customers to be able to move from platform to platform seamlessly. Uh, it's not a big deal, but uh, it will just have a little bit of a setback and delay. Okay, it's getting kind of exciting, you know, as the date of the CBOE solid X BTC ETF approval is approaching, there is a lot of buzz. And the buzz is because um, this particular one is currency backed, it's coin backed. And unlike some of the derivatives that have been applied for um, that are not, there are two that are actually backed by coins, and that is going to have a huge impact positively on price. So with sentiment in Crypto Street building up, it's difficult to say who will win the race. Everybody in the um, application process is trying to be the first 
for that approval. And the front runner currently seems to be uh, the CBOE Solid X by Van Eck. Van Eck did a great job at addressing five issues that the SEC is a little concerned with. One is validation, I'm sorry, valuation. One is liquidity, custody, arbitrage, and manipulation. So I think that the um, revised version that Van Eck has put forth has a very good chance. So here is the list. You can see that the Winklevoss twins had the Bitcoin shares, which they originally applied for back in July of 2013. It was Coinbase. However, as we all know, on the 26th, just last week, it was denied. But here is the Van Eck Solid X Bitcoin Trust. And it was, uh, had a, well, it was filed for on the 5th of June, and it is currently waiting for approval. The SEC has a date to look at it on 8-10. Now, they may or may not give an answer that day. I think they can push it uh, uh, 45 days out from this date, but either way, it's getting very soon for the answer. And then there is another one here called Bitwise, and it is a first ever basket ETF. It has some of the top 10 coins in the fund. It's very interesting. It's, it's been proposed by a gentleman, uh, Hunter Horsley. Here is a CNBC Fast Money interview of of his um, announcement. It's just four minutes and 42 seconds long. It's very convincing, actually. I think he has a very compelling um, proposition for the SEC. Now listen to this. 55% is in Bitcoin. 20% is in Ethereum. 9.4% in Ripple. 6.4% in BCH. 2.6% in Litecoin, 2.3% in Stellar, 1.3% in Dash, 1% in Zcash, and 1% in Ethereum Classic. It's going to be kind of the S&P 500 for crypto. That's what he how he describes it. And he has addressed in this ETF um, tax, custody, manipulation, um, liquidity, and so on. So I think it too has a very, very good chance. Uh, the index strategy is that it isn't specific to one coin. That's what makes it interesting. So I'm very, very much looking forward to seeing how this approval process goes. Morgan Stanley today gave us a little bit of a of a warning with some red flags. They say that the biggest sell-off since February is coming and it's going to hit the average investor hard. Now this is the um, stock market. This isn't the crypto market. So Morgan Stanley predicts that the market will drop further with technology and consumer stocks faring the worst. The weaker earnings beat uh, from several tech leaders and outright misses from Netflix and Facebook were simply additional support of our, Morgan Stanley's, defensive call, Chief U.S. Equity Strategist Michael Wilson says. So the average portfolio will suffer more because the selling will be concentrated in tech, consumer, and small cap shares, the firm says. Well, this came out just 20 hours ago. However, there is a silver lining According to this study conducted by the Hong Kong Blockchain Association, the HKBA, they revealed that 23% of Hong Kong investors would consider buying crypto in an economic crisis. So I think that this pretty much would be the same on a worldwide scale. So, you know, we've got two things happening. If we have a 
if we do have a dip in the stock market, that's one thing. But we also have a little bit of a potential trade war going on between the U.S. and China. And that is why the Hong Kong citizens feel a little uneasy. However, they really are going to, at least 23%, feel they would consider buying crypto to hedge against that crisis. So I think if we do have a a little bit of a, a financial downturn in the traditional market, I think people will turn to crypto. Okay, I have a giveaway. These are some great Ripple socks. They were offered to me and I thought, no, you know what? I want to give it to some lucky subscriber or somebody who's actually watching the channel or watching this video because here are the rules. I have a Twitter account, as you know, and I'm going to show you what my Twitter handle is in a second. Um, I want you to tell me in this video and the first person who answers the question correctly will win one pair of blue Ripple socks. So here is first though, let me show you. This is the sock source. It is the Crypto Man. Cute, huh? He does a Ripple sock, an XRP sock, and a Tron sock. He has an Etsy store, an eBay store, and an Amazon store. So here is your question. This is my Twitter, and my handle is Sento Sumo Saba. And I have said on previous videos what that actually means. So if you can remember, I know this is a little bit of a hard question, but if you can remember, please put it down in the comment section. The first person to answer it correctly will win a pair of socks. And the way we'll do that is uh, you can direct message me on uh, Twitter, give me your shipping address, and then I will give the shipping address to Crypto Man, and he'll ship those socks to you direct. So what is the meaning of Sento Sumo Saba? All right. Now, speaking of socks, <laughs> here comes your fluff story. If you don't follow me on a regular basis, usually at the end of the videos, I'll give you some cultural fluff about Japan. This is a Japanese sock and it's called a tabby. And tabbies are really comfortable, but the big toe is separated from the rest of the toes. And they come in all different patterns, sizes, Sometimes they come up to the ankle. Sometimes they're a little bit higher like this one I have in my hands. And let me just tell you about the history of tabby. So they are a traditional Japanese sock dating back to the 15th century. Ankle high and with a separation between the big toe and other toes, they are worn by both men and women with zori. Zori is a fancy sandal or geta. A geta is a little less uh, fancy. It's more casual. Sometimes it's made of wood. And other traditional thonged footwear. Tabby are essential with traditional clothing like kimono and other wafuku. Wafuku is traditional Japanese clothing as well as being worn by samurai in the feudal era. Oh, the ninja wore them uh, as well. I mean, it's just, it is, it is the sock of Japan. The most common color is white, and the white tabby are worn in formal situations, such as at tea ceremonies. Uh, plus, it doesn't mention here, but if you are playing any traditional uh, instrument, you know, basically, if you're wearing any kimono, you're going to be wearing the white version. So men sometimes wear blue or black, uh, and the patterned or colored tabby are also available and are worn most often by women, although they are gaining popularity among men as well. There are some really great patterns with dragons and um, 
lucky symbols for men in the construction business. It's, it's really quite common. In contrast to socks that, when pulled on, fit the foot snugly, um, well, in contrast to socks that, when pulled on, fit the foot snugly, yeah, because they, uh, because of the elastic weave, tabby are sewn from cloth cut to form. And they are open in the back so that they can be slipped on and then have a row of kind of little tiny fasteners, kind of like an eyelet fastener along the um, backside that can be closed. Um, sometimes though, you'll find that they are Velcro. And in this style, you can see it's just got a Western top but it has a reinforced heel and then has the separation for the toe. And then you have a Jika tabby, and that is worn by construction workers, farmers, gardeners, people who work uh, as fishmongers. Um, it, it's, it's really everywhere. I see them all the time. They are made of heavier, tougher material and often have a rubber sole on the bottom. They're very durable. You can wear them in all sorts of weather. You can wear them on construction sites. And like other tabby, Jika tabby are toe divided, so they can be worn with the slip on uh, socks as well. Uh, so anyway, oh, I didn't know this, that the Bridgestone Corporation is credited for their innovation. Bridgestone, you know, is the big tire company in Japan. I didn't know they are credited with um, developing and creating the style for the construction workers. Yeah, even the gardeners wear them. Uh, you know, it's really just very commonplace here. Okay, so there is your Japanese sock fluff. I think if you want to try, you can find them on eBay, a lot of sellers selling them, because I think they're rather difficult to find outside of Japan. Okay, everybody, that's all I have for you today. I am happy that you joined me. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.